Welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery, brought to you by spiritualteachers.org. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. Hello and welcome to the Journals of Spiritual Discovery podcast. Before we begin, there's two upcoming events that I want to mention. This Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm leading an online session for the Pittsburgh Self-Inquiry Group. To participate in that free event, go to tatfoundation.org, click on the events page, then scroll down to the local group section where you'll find contact info for the Pittsburgh Group. And while you're on that events page, you can also sign up for the next TAT Talks event, which is coming up this Saturday July 15th at noon Eastern Time. The featured guest is going to be me. The format's Q&A, so there will be lots of time to ask your burning questions. I hope to see you there. Now, on to the podcast. Ramana Maharshi was one of the great sages of the 20th century. For this episode, I want to explore what Ramana had to say about self-inquiry and the question, Who am I? I'm going to read two extracts from the written words of Ramana Maharshi. Both of these appear in Arthur Osborne's book, The Collected Works of Ramana Maharshi. Though Osborne uses some Hindu terminology, I've chosen primarily to use his English translations of these terms during this reading. And one thing to keep in mind is that I will be using the term self a lot, but when Ramana refers to self, it's always the capital S self, meaning the absolute. If he's talking about the personal self or the day-to-day self, he always uses the term in this particular reading, individual self. So the first one that I will read is an extract from a piece that Ramana wrote called, Who Am I? Every living being longs always to be happy untainted by sorrow, and everyone has the greatest love for himself, which is solely due to the fact that happiness is his real nature. Hence, in order to realize that inherent and untainted happiness, which indeed he daily experiences when the mind is subdued in deep sleep, it is essential that he should know himself. For obtaining such knowledge, the inquiry, Who am I? In quest of the self is the best means. Who am I? I am not this physical body, nor am I the five organs of sense perception. I am not the five organs of external activity, nor am I the five vital forces. Nor am I even the thinking mind. Neither am I the unconscious state of nescence which retains merely the subtle latencies of the mind, while being free from the functional activity of the sense organs and of the mind and being unaware of the existence of the objects of sense perception. Therefore, summarily rejecting all the above-mentioned physical adjuncts and their functions, saying, I am not this, no, nor am I this, nor this. That which then remains separate and alone by itself, that pure awareness is what I am. This awareness is by its very nature, existence, consciousness, bliss. If the mind, which is the instrument of knowledge and is the basis of all activity, subsides, the perception of the world as an objective reality ceases unless the illusory perception of the serpent and the rope ceases, the rope on which the illusion is formed is not perceived as such. Similarly, unless the illusory nature of the perception of the world as an objective reality ceases, the vision of the true nature of the self on which the illusion is formed is not obtained. The mind is a unique power in the Atman, whereby thoughts occur to one. On scrutiny as to what remains after eliminating all thoughts, 
will be found that there is no such thing as mind apart from thought. So then, thoughts themselves constitute the mind. Nor is there any such thing as the physical world apart from and independent of thought. In deep sleep there are no thoughts, nor is there a world. In the wakeful and dream state thoughts are present, and there is also the world. Just as the spider draws out the thread of the cobweb from within itself, and withdraws it again into itself, in the same way the mind projects the world out of itself and absorbs it back into itself. The world is perceived as an apparent objective reality when the mind is externalized, thereby forsaking its identity with the self. When the world is thus perceived, the true nature of the self is not revealed. Conversely, when the self is realized, the world ceases to appear as an objective reality. By a steady, and continuous investigation into the nature of the mind, the mind is transformed into that to which the eye refers, and that is in fact the self. Mind has necessarily to depend for its existence on something gross. It never subsists by itself. It is this mind that is otherwise called the subtle body, ego, or soul, that which arises in the physical body as I is the mind. If one inquires whence the I thought and the body arises, in the first instance it will be found that it is from the heart. That is the source and stay of the mind. Or again, even if one merely continuously repeats to oneself inwardly, I I, with the entire mind fixed thereon, that also leads one to the same source. The first and foremost of all the thoughts that arise in the mind is the primal I thought. It is only after the rise or origin of the I thought that innumerable other thoughts arise. In other words, only after the first personal pronoun I has arisen to the second and third personal pronouns, you, he, etc., occur to the mind, and they cannot subsist without the former, since every other thought can occur only after the rise of the I thought, and since the mind is nothing but a bundle of thoughts. It is only through the inquiry, who am I, that the mind subsides. Moreover, the integral I-thought implicit in such inquiry, having destroyed all other thoughts, gets itself finally destroyed or consumed, just as the stick used for stirring the burning funeral pyre gets consumed. Even when extraneous thoughts sprout up during such inquiry, do not seek to complete the rising thought, but instead deeply inquire within, to whom has this thought occurred? No matter how many thoughts thus occur to you, if you would, with acute vigilance, inquire immediately as and when each individual thought arises, to whom it has occurred, you would find it is to me. If then you inquire, who am I? The mind gets introverted and the rising thought also subsides. In this manner, as you persevere more and more in the practice of self-inquiry, the mind acquires increasing strength and power to abide in its source. It is only when the subtle mind is externalized through the activity of the intellect and the sense organs that gross name and form constituting the world appear. When, on the other hand, the mind stays firmly in the heart, they recede and disappear. Restraint of the outgoing mind and its absorption in the heart is known as introversion. The release of the mind and its emergence from the heart is known as objectiveness. If in this manner the mind becomes absorbed in the heart, the ego or I 
which is the center of the multitude of thoughts, finally vanishes, and pure consciousness or self, which subsists during all the states of the mind, alone remains resplendent. It is this state, where there is not the slightest trace of the I thought, that is the true being of oneself. And that is called quiescence or silence. This state of mere inherence and pure being is known as the vision of wisdom. Such inherence means and implies the entire subsidence of the mind and the self. Nothing other than this, and no psychic powers of the mind such as thought reading, telepathy, and clairvoyance can be wisdom. Atman alone exist and is real. The threefold reality of world, individual soul, and God is, like the appearance of silver in the mother of pearl, an imaginary creation in the Atman. They appear and disappear simultaneously. The self alone is the world, the I and God. All that exists is but the manifestation of the Supreme. For the subsidence of mind, and there is no other means more effective and adequate than self-inquiry, even though by other means the mind subsides, that is only apparently so, it will rise again. The second reading is from the first work that Ramana Maharshi ever wrote. It was written about 1901 and is titled Self-Inquiry. The extract I'll read is from a section called Inquiry into the Self. In this chapter is given clearly the path of inquiry into the self, or who am I? Is not the sense of I natural to all beings, expressed in all their feelings as I came, I went, I did, or I was? On questioning what this is, we find that the body is identified with I, because movements and similar functions pertain to the body. Can the body then be this I consciousness? He was not there before birth. It is composed of the five elements. It is absent in sleep, and it eventually becomes a corpse. No, it cannot be. The sense of I which arises in the body for the time being is otherwise called the ego, ignorance, illusion, impurity, or individual self. The purpose of all the scriptures is this inquiry into the self. It is declared in them that the annihilation of the ego sense is liberation. How then can one remain indifferent to this teaching? Can the body, which is insentient as a piece of wood, shine and function as I? No. Therefore, lay aside this insentient body as though it were truly a corpse. Do not even murmur I, but inquire keenly within what it is that now shines within the heart as I. Underlying the unceasing flow of varied thoughts, there arises the continuous unbroken awareness, silent and spontaneous as I I in the heart. If one catches hold of it and remains still, it will completely annihilate the sense of I in the body and will itself disappear as a fire of burning camphor. Sages and scriptures proclaim this to be liberation. The veil of ignorance can never completely hide the individual self. How can it? Even the ignorant do not fail to speak of the I. It only hides the reality, I am the self, or I am pure consciousness, and confounds the I with the body. The self is self-effulgent. One need give it no mental picture anyway. The thought that imagines it is itself bondage because the self is the effulgence transcending darkness and light. One should not think of it with the mind. Such imagination will end in bondage, whereas the self spontaneously shines at the absolute. 
this inquiry into the self and devotional meditation evolves into the state of the absorption of the mind into the self and leads to liberation and unqualified bliss. The great sages have declared that only by the help of this devotional inquiry into the self can liberation be attained, because the ego in the form of the I thought is the root of the tree of illusion. Its destruction fells illusion, even as a tree is felled by the cutting of its roots. This easy method of annihilating the ego is alone worthy to be called devotion, knowledge, union, or meditation. In the I am the body consciousness, the three bodies composed of the five sheaths are contained. If that mode of consciousness is removed, all else drops off of its own accord. All other bodies depend on it. There is no need to eliminate them separately, because the scriptures declare that thought alone is bondage. It is their final injunction that the best method is to surrender the mind in the form of the I thought to him, the self, and keeping quite still, not forget him. Now, I know that some people have read the works of Ramana Maharshi, and they've thought to themselves, well, what do I do with this? Or they find that uh, meditating on who am I is a dry, a rote sort of practice. It doesn't have any juice for them. And my response to that is that you definitely should always pursue that which is of most meaning to you or most interesting to you, or generates the deepest curiosity in yourself. And I don't mean uh, curiosity about uh, what new show is on television tonight, of course, but that inner curiosity, the desire to know your source. You can really think of when Maharshi is asking that question, who am I, that is the distillation of that curiosity that we all have. The words may not be the words that have meaning for you, but the spirit of that question, who am I, is what he's asking you to pursue and to turn inward to look for. And that's the thread that he's talking about. Who am I? Where does that I emanate from? What is that source? There is value in pursuing that inquiry, that interior inquiry, not just saying to yourself mentally, who am I, but looking, keenly looking, observing, watching inside yourself for that point or that place from which the I thought is emerging and holding the mind and the attention on that. Thank you for listening to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. For more information about today's guest, as well as more interviews, books, and other resources, go to spiritualteachers.org. That's spiritualteachers.org.